This topic is something that has been of great interest to me, and it's been part of a journey. I spent the first decade of my career as a civil servant, and I observed the system of government that I was working in. And then I took a job as a chief of staff to a minister, and I saw the system through the eyes of the elected officials and the political staff. And then I left, mostly because the people told my minister to go away, <laughs> and I became a lobbyist. I worked for a college to try and convince the provincial government to create a new university, and, and we did, the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. So I spent a decade outside of government trying to influence it, thinking about how it works, how the civil service works, how the political part works, and how they work together, and how I could influence. And all this time I had been teaching, and I would often find myself in front of a group of students trying to explain how things work. And I have been reflecting on this concept and this relationship ever since. And so what I want to do today is talk to you about what it means and um, give you some ideas about how it can be used to the benefit of all and to yourselves in your own careers. And uh, some ideas about how we can adopt more of this core competency as a, a form of training. So I start with the premise that there is a great opportunity for leadership at all levels in the organization. And I've been privileged to, to as, a, as an observer, to see this in every organization I've belonged in. And it's remarkable when you see people who don't formally have leadership roles demonstrating leadership. And I will argue today that political acuity will help us uh, do that. The other premise I'll start with is that great leaders are reflective. We often hear from professionals, uh, lawyers, who talk about a legal practice or, or doctors, a medical practice. I think leadership and management is a practice. It's something that you try to learn as much about as you can, but then you practice it. And I know from my, uh, my own experience, the first time I had to fire someone, was an agonizing exercise. Even though the person really deserved to go home, it was agonizing. I thought about it, I went to HR, I tried to learn as much as I could about best practices, and I went over the script in my head, and I planned out all of the various strategies. If he says this, then I'll say that. And then I went in there, and it was painful, and I went out, and I found myself thinking and rethinking about what I said, and what I wish I said, and what I could have said. I think that's management, I think that's leadership, where we practice things and over time, as we have more experiences, we employ what we've learned in ways where we are experimenting. And I think um, leadership is exactly like that. So here I am, uh, a, a public servant, new in my role, a junior policy analyst, and at the same time, in the evenings, I'm teaching, and I'm, I'm, I'm working during the day, and I'm trying to take theory and practice and put it together so my students benefit greatly. And so here I am in front of my first class, and my students say, okay, so how are decisions made in government? How does it work? And of course, as an academic, we're supposed to start with the literature, the theories that exist as a way of trying to describe or explain, and then we can talk more specifically about the practical realities. So I started with a theory that uh, an American political scientist named David Easton spent 30 years of his career putting together. So I know it's late and you're tired, and, and these are very complex ideas, but let me take you through this theory. He said, stuff goes in, he called it input, because that's, as academics, what we do. We find big words to explain a simple concept. So input, there's the stuff that goes in, and then he said what happens is political, and we don't know much about that. And then stuff comes out, and this is the, the output. And I sat in front of that class, and as I said it, I, I felt as though I was cheating them. That I, you know, I showed them this diagram, but there was this, this big box in the middle that I really couldn't understand. As a civil servant, I knew about the input because I would write the briefing note or the cabinet submission or the white paper and I would send it to my manager. My manager would make changes, never making it any better, and it would come back to me and then I would send it back. And these are in the days of a dictaphone where, it, you know, you 
sound out your memo and it go into the word processing center and then would come out and you'd edit it, it would go out and then it would print on letterhead okay and you know there's two days right there and so he's making changes that I really don't think should happen and then it goes to the director and the director makes changes in the ADM and then the deputy and then finally it goes into the minister's office. Now my experience has been if you've done something terribly wrong you usually hear pretty loud and pretty fast but mostly I never heard a thing and I would walk around for a couple of days decompressing wondering wouldn't there be a statue erected to me or a parade in my honor because I got this thing through all these layers in you know no time and and there's great advice now sitting on someone's desk and we hear nothing days or weeks later still nothing and then all of a sudden a press release or a story in the newspaper that talks about your thing and I looked at it and I would say well how did this thing that I did that went in come out like this and that's when I realized I don't understand the political part so I did as any young policy analyst would do is I went to my manager and I said so now there was this thing and we put it up into the minister's office and somehow it came out and why did this how is it that this what what goes on in there and he said well that's political and I said yes exactly so what happens in the box the and he said well it's politics I, I, I don't have time to explain it and what I realized was he didn't know what happened in the box <laughs> at all and I've now discovered through my entire career that everyone goes around throwing things they don't understand into this big garbage can and we call it politics we say well it's, it's politics why did she get the job and I did well it's it's politics <laughs> what does that mean so what I what I wanted to do was try to understand this and when we talk about political acuity we usually use the phrase well he doesn't get it or she gets it and I really wanted to know what it was and I, I did some digging and what I realized was in many of the management roles within the civil service it says as a core competency must have political acuity and I knew that it existed because some people had it <laughs> and you could tell that there were some people and this is probably experience many of us have shared we joined at the same time with someone else but yet they've moved up the ladder really quickly and you think she's not any smarter than I am I work harder than she does why is she there and I'm not there yet and, and we said well it's it's political <laughs> and so there's something there that everyone tells us well you either have or you don't and uh, as I learn more I realize that there's a lot that we can learn and there's a lot that we can teach and so I'm gonna share with you some ideas about what it is for the most part this thing that I haven't yet defined is hard to teach people people have this kind of in, intuitive nature about the way they exist in a context and most of us figure well you can't teach that that's like an instinct or an ability it's a gift and so we, we assume we just can't do it we also uh, say that the rules of the game are always changing and so it's not as though you can go and learn those rules and you have it because it constantly changes you know the context is so important here why does uh, a glass of orange juice charged at sixteen dollars cause a minister to resign you know if if it fit within the Treasury Board guidelines that said you know you could charge this much for a meal etc then why uh, in the case of eHealth Ontario did a consultant have to resign because she submitted a receipt for a coffee it completely fit within the rules and so as a as an academic standing in front of a classroom full of people or as a practitioner helping with orientation for new new staff to the civil service I often found myself having a hard time explaining what the rules are and I found out that it's those people with political acuity that understood that the context created a new reality and they could read it better and they had a better sense for what was on and what was off the last part of this is that most people don't like to talk about it either because they don't really understand it or because it involves what they often think of as sort of behind the scenes things unsavory things like networking and informal relationships and, and that that makes a lot of us uncomfortable because we live in a world where there are, are rules and things are written down 
Often I get the question, well, you've been a civil servant and you've been a political advisor, what's the difference? And I would say that the, the worlds are different and the difference would be this. In the civil service, we write everything down. Our, our, our dogma is the written word. And when something falls through the cracks, we want to write things to fill those cracks. But in politics, it isn't about the written word, it's about a picture. It's about an image, and it's about the way you feel about them. And so you've got these two different worlds that try to work together in a way, and here we are as civil servants trying to serve that. It can be confusing people. So what I've done is tried to come up with a definition. So what is this political acuity thing that we all know exists? We've seen it, we have some of the skills, we want to develop others, but you know, how do we better understand it and, and how can we learn more about it? So I think there are four concepts here that form the basis of political acuity. The first is the idea that this is a way of thinking and behaving. So it, it's, it's the way you process information, the way you see the world, but then the way you act on it. What you say, to whom you say it, and how you say it. It's also a series of skills and knowledge that you can employ to get things done, to move things forward. And so people with a political acuity have this. But still now, you're probably thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm on board, I get it, but so I still don't understand it. What does it involve? Four things. The first idea is that it starts with uh, personal and interpersonal. So you have to know yourself and the way you think. And one of the things we learn uh, about emotional intelligence is our capacity to regulate our own behaviors and, the, and to say things or not say things or to say them in certain ways. And the interpersonal is the way we get along with others. So that's the first part. It starts there because we can't start to act in a sophisticated way in an organization that is complex and not only survive but thrive if we don't understand our own self and the basics of interpersonal uh, connectivity. The second part of this is the idea that people with political acuity have a great capacity to read people and situations. Now, I must admit, I don't know why, but when I walk in a room, I have a feeling and it, it strikes me as quite uh, strong. Uh, it's, it's a happy feeling, it's a sad feeling, it's a serious feeling, and I can tell in a meeting that uh, someone's feeling hurt or this is going to be difficult for someone. And, and so what I try to do is, is to do something with those feelings, translate them into choices and actions. So as a manager, for example, if I have my team around the table, then I think, well, you know, this might embarrass Bob. So how can I position this so that it doesn't? And I think people who do this intuitively have, have this great and wonderful skill. But for most of us that don't have it, we've got to, we've got to develop it, and I'll, I'll talk about that that in a moment. So we start with ourselves and then we start to read the world around us, the people and the context. The third part is the idea that we all work with other people and these I, I loosely define as, as stakeholders. I think of stakeholders as anyone who is interested in or affected by what you do. And that can be your immediate team, your colleagues within the organization, it can be external partners, it can be citizens, it can be anybody who is interested in and affected by what you do. And we have to start thinking strategically about them. I once had a great pleasure of working for a deputy minister who I thought was extraordinarily strategic. And I would watch, and I would learn, and I would, I would sometimes get why he made the decisions he did. And other times I would ask, and what it came down to was this, he was a master chess player. He would think about the choices he had and he would say, well, if I do this, what is my opponent or the stakeholder or the minister or my colleague? What are they gonna do? What choices do they have? And if they make that choice, then what will I do? And I guess his magic was he always could think two or three steps ahead and he would have considered most of those various options. And to my mind, that's a lot about working with stakeholders, thinking very strategically. The fourth and final part of political acuity is the idea that all of this not only happens within a local context, but something bigger than us. So the environmental scanning, what's happening around the world, how does that change the way that uh, we do what we do, or how does it affect us? So here we are. Now, what does it look like in practice? 
Well, um, it involves observation and reflection. And so we've learned a lot recently from uh, both literature, academic work, and popular uh, writings about something called active listening. I find that most of us, when we're engaged in, in a networking session, for example, we show up to the reception, we find someone we know, we glom onto them, and we talk to them the whole night. And that's great for you know, ensuring uh, relationships are strong and, and getting to know people, but if the goal and objective of being there is to actually expand your network or to bring home information, uh, market intelligence, for example, we've got to get out there. And so once we get out there, what are we doing? Are we listening? And I find mostly when we're in a circle of people, we're thinking, okay, so I really think what he's saying is interesting. So when it's my turn, this is what I'm going to say. And we're going through what that sentence will look like because you really want to sound smart because this is a group of people you want to impress. And so you're, you're going through this all in your head and you're really not listening. And Active listening and observation are hugely important parts of the gift that those with acuity have and what we can develop as a competency on our own. So it starts there. I think it's also connecting the dots. Once we start to see patterns together, we're going to find uh, ways forward or we're going to find solutions or we're going to see answers that we, we just didn't know existed. There's a great uh, quote uh, when Wayne Gretzky retired, many people interviewed him and they said, you know, so why were you such a great hockey player? And he would say, I never went to where the puck was, I always went to where it was going. And I think when you're connecting dots, you're starting to see patterns and trends that perhaps others have not. And for most of us, the dots are there. We just have to identify them and we have to do something with that. It's kind of like the life we have now. We've got the internet. And so now we're, we're bombarded with information. I think people with political acuity can sift out the good information from the bad information and then do something with it. Provide some form of analysis that helps them understand you know, what, where to go, what to do. Most people, and I, and I think many of us as civil servants have struggled with this, we are doing more and more with less and less. We have so much to do, so little time. We can hardly just do our job, let alone start thinking about things beyond us. And I think one of the key elements of having and exercising political acuity is thinking about the big picture and, and things that are beyond the immediate. This is where we start to to think more broadly, and, and that's a skill, and that's a, a pattern of behavior that uh, will, will be very successful for us. Uh, the context, always important, the big picture, the mission, the vision, the values, whatever it is, that end game, you know, why are we in this? I had a manager once who said to me, his, uh, as he was the president of a, of a university, he said, unless I really have to, I don't say no. And other times he would say, um, Let's remember why we're here. And it was that capacity to always sort of rise above petty politics or, or the immediate pressures and then find that bigger thing that drew us or, or that we could steer towards that would help us uh, find our way. And I always thought that was very useful. Formal and informal relations, absolutely important. When I was an intern uh, at the Ministry of Environment in Ontario, at lunch, I joined the men's basketball league. And I played basketball with people who were at my level, but managers and directors. And what would happen over time is you would build these relationships. And here I am back in the pool. We've got a problem. We're trying to get something done. It's almost impossible. But I know the manager or the director. So I pick up the phone, and I'm able to connect in a way that moves us beyond this problem or this road bump many of the other interns that were with me that didn't participate in these kinds of things found themselves at a disadvantage. So it was something that I was able to utilize that helped me get things done because I had these informal relationships. And the last thing I'll talk about is, is thinking strategically. Most of the time when we're in a meeting and we're surprised or, or, or upset or angered, we want to just react. And I find uh, almost nine times out of you regret it. You're thinking in the heat of the moment. And so to the greatest extent possible, I find that people with political acuity, as we've studied these leaders, have a capacity to count to 10, have a capacity to get beyond that emotional feeling and to move beyond in a more rational way. And that's a skill, and that's not an easy thing to do. 
Why does it matter? From the perspective of a former public servant, I think you know what we're there to do is provide good information so that they can make informed decisions. And I want the government to work well. As a citizen, as a civil servant, these are things that, that I would like. And I believe that we're only going to uh, build and maintain the, the trust of the public if they see us behaving in ways that are honorable and with great integrity. So what I want to do is share a couple of cases of simple things that where people have used various forms of political acuity as a way of behaving in, in a really thoughtful way, moving forward, being successful. The first is a really simple one. As uh, a guy who wrote cabinet submissions, I was very junior, I coordinated them, and then I called cabinet office and there was an administrative assistant there named Gemma, a wonderful woman. Her job was really simple. Take all the cabinet submissions, make the right number of copies, distribute them to all the ministries so each minister's office could review them before the cabinet meetings. And she typed up the cabinet. And so what I started to notice uh, as I would go through the process of coordinating these things, getting her the copies is, after a while I would start to read the minutes from these cabinet meetings and I would start to notice a pattern. And it was a really simple one. Cabinet was scheduled for three hours every other week and there were six items on the agenda. They were all supposed to be scheduled for half an hour. And what I noticed was really simple. The first item took more than an hour. The second item almost took an hour. The third item took about 45 minutes. The fourth item usually caused the Secretary of Cabinet to say, mm -hmm, and was passed almost without any review or consideration. The, the fifth item uh, was, was sped along, and almost always the sixth item was bumped to the next agenda. So when I had a Cabinet submission that had uh, tenuous support that, you know, if we didn't move quickly, we would lose the support of the individuals below, I would call Gemma and say, hey Gemma, unless someone is ins uh, instructing you otherwise, could you please make this item number four? And it didn't matter whether it was a million or a hundred million, that was the one that just got passed, bumped. I'm sure it's fine, everybody's ready, you know, it's, it's good, and, and they would just, and where we needed more dialogue, there was probably more time. Gemma, could you make it number five or number six? And that was a way of a guy who had no authority, no power, working with someone else who was just performing a function, identifying a pattern, connecting some of the dots, starting to see that there was a, an emerging pattern of behavior. A simple way to look at the world around you and ask yourself, you know, is there something going on here and can I use it to my benefit? Here's a really simple example. I was uh, teaching in China a few weeks ago and I was on, it's a 15 hour flight to Shanghai and there was a baby on board and this baby started to cry and I mean the kind of crying where you know it just never ended and it was at a level of a, a shriek that people had blood coming out of their ears we were all sort of thinking about you know what can we do to to deal with this problem there was talk of a smothering and uh, sort of the you know the the Airline attendants were complaining, they were frustrated. One of them started talking about calling the union. And it was a real mess. But one of the flight attendants pulled out of her apron a tiny little toy airplane and gave it to the child. The child stopped crying, played with this thing for the whole flight, and all of a sudden, you know, problem resolved. Someone who thought, you know, uh, outside of that immediate blood-curdling scream that would ma made us all tense, and it was hard to think straight, she kind of thought, in, you know, in a different way and solved the problem by, uh, by a very innovative approach. The town hall, thinking about working with stakeholders. I once got a call from a municipality that said, we need to uh, site an incinerator, and it's in an urban center, and it's, uh, it's proven to be rather contentious. And I thought, well, this is like research from the University of the Obvious, right? You want to put an incinerator next to somebody's house? Of course, it's going to be contentious. And they said, so could you help us? And I said, well, what, what do you need help with? They said, well, we're, we're having trouble with these town halls. They end up being like that scene in uh, Frankenstein where the villagers come with the pitchforks and try to kill the monster. All it becomes is the media shows up, the mayor and the councillors are at the front, the protesters scream and holler, and it's this epic kind of protest that accomplishes nothing. And I said, well, what's the purpose of the town hall? Well, we want to bring both parties together, the, the citizens and, and the, the party. 
and we want to learn from each other. We want to walk away with a greater understanding of this issue and why and the benefits. And, and we want to learn from citizens about you know, their concerns and we want to present some of our challenges and constraints. And you know, this should really be a dialogue. And I said, well, then don't have a town hall. Now, there are lots of new ways of doing consultations, but they had in their bylaws that they had to have a town hall. So I asked, well, where do you do it? They do it in a local hotel. So I said, okay, so from now on, we're not going to do it at a hotel. So we did it at a church. But not just any church, a Byzantine church with icons all through the ceilings where Jesus is looking down at everybody with these eyes. Literally, the behavior of all the individuals who entered the meeting changed. We used an external facilitator, so an independent person who moderated. We used some questions to help guide the conversation. It was the first time at the end of the night actually heard each other. And everyone walked away understanding more. The second time we did it, we knew it was going to get even more contentious because we were narrowing down the number of sites. And so we had the ladies auxiliary on standby. If I were they would come out with cookies up and down the aisle. And we also announced and introduced Mrs. McGillicuddy's grade eight civics class, who was here to study local democracy <laughs> in action and write a report about what they learned, etc. Nary a peep, a great conversation. There was some disagreement about things, but they spoke and they talked. And so I think in, in different ways, we can exhibit leadership by employing political acuity that can help us get our job done. So I often argue that if you don't develop your political acuity skills, you're going to develop what I call the political blind spot, you know, not seeing things that are going to come and get you. And if you don't develop that, the political blind spot will lead to political acuity deficit disorder, which will lead to career limiting moves. And so this is something we all need to develop as a way of not only surviving, but thriving. What I've learned uh, over time, and sometimes the hard way, is that when we're immersed in our own place, whether it's our workplace, or our home, our town, our culture, that we often don't realize that there are other ways of doing things and that all of us come from different experiences, different realities, and, and today what's going on in my personal life may behave and, and, and other things that are happening in the community all have an impact. And to the, to the extent we can sort of crawl out of our own skin and think about the world around us and start to move through these layers that, that I would include as, as part of political acuity, the better we are. And so how do I get some of this? You know, obviously, it's very important. You know, you never know when you're going to be a flight attendant and have a screaming baby. You know, where do I get this? Well, I think it starts here, like with layers. We start first by uh, understanding formal processes. So when we hire people, we have to give them and it starts with the flow charts and the organization charts. So you're, you're a PM14 and you work in this hierarchy, and then there are processes, there are these flow charts, and this is how uh, an idea becomes a policy or, or a bill becomes a law. And you know, we can go through all of that. That's where it starts. That's the ground zero for political acuity. But then we go beyond. And what we try to do is get people thinking about informal processes. How do things work in your office? Where does the power reside? I can tell you that the power doesn't always reside with the person who occupies that top box in the organization chart. Everybody matters and everyone plays a role. And if we can engage people in, in our relationships, both formal and informal, we have an ability to get things done. So because I knew the person who typed the agenda and I could get something on an agenda, that would help me in my work. Environmental factors, the climate, the culture, uh, all of these things impact on what we do. So think about uh, the, a topic that has gotten a great deal of attention lately, sexual harassment in the workplace. Well, the way we react to it today is very different post the Jan Gomeshi affair than before. And so all of this context affects us. And if we know what's happening, out there and how it impacts on us, we're better able to understand the best way forward. Personalities, organizational politics. How many of you have worked in, in an organization where you know there was someone and their proclivities, their personality, you know, we we tippy toe around them or we you know 
we all live in a world where there are people in our lives, both formal and informal, at work and in, in our social world. And if we understand those personalities and we get who they are and what motivates them, we'll probably be much better off because then we'll understand those motivations and we can play to them. And the last part is the political factor. Now, I think of political acuity in two ways. In, in government or in, in a place like this, we, we think of political acuity as being, well, our board of directors are elected. So this organization has elected people, which that introduces politics into the organization. So office politics in politics is pretty political. But political acuity can be in any organization. Wherever there are two people, there, you know, there is a dynamic. There's an organization, and, and people create this reality. So for some, political acuity means how can I work with the minister's office or how can I work with the premier? In other cases, it's simply how can I f function in an organization where there's, there are formal, uh, formal roles and responsibilities. Let me give you an example. My wife and I were going to renovate our kitchen and we went to visit a friend who has a, a kitchen cabinet making company. And after we decided what we were going to do, he said, let me take you on a tour of the facility. And as we walked through the facility, he would introduce us to people, say, hey, this is vice president of operations, and this is the manager of plant services, and this is the manager of supply chain, and this is the supervisor of the shift, and, and this, is the, um, you know, this is the master cabinet maker. And then there was a fellow on the assembly line with a hard hat and, and boots and, and a mallet, and he said, but that's the guy who actually you know, is the most important person in the whole organization. And I said, well, you know, look, I study this stuff. You know, I, I, I think I've pieced together an organization chart for your, your enterprise. You know, this guy is a worker. He's on the line. I mean, how could he be the most important person? That's not how it works in my world. And he said, ah, but here, here's what you need to know. In this particular factory, they all come from a particular ethnic background. And he's been in the country longer. He has much better English skills. And so when they come home with a, a letter from school that they're having trouble with, or citizenship papers, or uh, a letter from the government and he helps them through it. What he has got is a kind of a friendship and a loyalty. So when he's not happy about something on the shop floor and he says, put your tools down, work stops. Nowhere on the org chart does it say he has that kind of authority. Uh, if they have to get something done quickly, a special order, and they really got to, he's the guy who can make this, the system work quicker. And so within all organizations, there are our people, and the truth is, there you know there there is politics, and so it's not always who we think it is that has that power. So within any organization, political acuity is is a hugely uh, important asset. Within our world, where there is a public service, and the the elected officials are indeed our masters, who set the tone, who set the agenda, who pass the budgets, uh, you know, and who make the decisions, you know, it becomes even more complex. So if I was thinking about how would I get this, I would do an assessment and ask myself, you know, in these four areas, where do I have strengths, where are there some gaps, and I would look at it in the following way. I would start with some form of a foundational learning program where I would try to understand the formal organization, and I would look around and say, well, how, how do decisions actually get made, and, and why is she always in his office, and, 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 and what you know, what's happening here? Why did that, that go through and this one didn't succeed? And I start to try to look for those, those patterns or try to connect those dots, and I'd start there. Then I would think about uh, influence. My capacity to get you to do something that you weren't going to do. And there's lots of literature here and uh, lots of books, lots of training that is available. And the capacity to use influence is something that people with political acuity do and do effectively. The third component would be stakeholder engagement, whether it's your own colleagues at work or whether it's those external partners, stakeholder engagement and strategic stakeholder engagement are really a fundamental part of this. And then the last component would be uh, coaching and mentoring where uh, someone uh, would uh, provide us with advice, where we could bring challenges, we could, we could take some solutions forward, we could practice, and then we could reflect. And so for me, political acuity is a way of thinking about 
where we are and uh, how we can behave in ways that help us to advance our goals and objectives. And I think that it's the kind of thing that, that is the difference between success and failure often, whether it's I got the job, I didn't get the job, or whether I was able to accomplish my, my business goals and objectives for the organization. It's what helps the political part of government work better with the civil service. It's how organizations um, succeed. And so as a core competency, I believe that it is not only something that's critical, but also that's something that can be learned and taught. And so these are my early ideas based on you know, the first 20 years of my career as a practitioner and now as an academic looking at great leaders and asking, you know, what is it that they have and how can I get some of that? And I'm starting to realize that now with all of us having smartphones, we can look up practically any information we want. It's those soft skills that are really the difference between success and failure. And we've been building people through universities and colleges to become more and more technical. And in that, I think we may be losing that interpersonal. And with that, I fear that you know, this area is going to be an area of uh, weakness. And so I've been trying to learn as much as I can by uh, interviewing and meeting with as many people as I can and then starting to try to put some of these ideas out there to get feedback. So these are my early ideas as part of my research. I look forward to your uh, reaction, your, your questions, and I, and I thank you kindly for listening. Thank you.